Hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for joining another discussion at the Ketonian Corner. I'm Jolene Hale, here with my guest, uh, or my co-partner here, John Davidson. Hello, John. Hey. So today, we have a very special guest with us. Um, my friend Tom Seast is here to discuss fasting with us, and we've got some questions for him. So pretty excited to get started. Um, hello, Tom. Hello. So do you want to kind of give us a brief um, overview of, um, you know, what you, how you got into keto and, um, you know, some of your, some of your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, I actually grew up near Peoria in the town of Hopedale and um, I was fairly athletic, uh, averaged 12, 13 miles a day on my bike as a kid, uh, doing paper routes through high school and so on. And uh, moved to Chicago, got married, and uh, always a little heavy, but never, never morbidly obese uh, until I'd been married about eight years, and I fell down a series of steps and injured my back, and then I just quit exercising altogether. And um, at that point, I ballooned up or somewhere north of 550. I don't really know what I weighed because I couldn't find the scale to weigh me. Um, one of the questions that somebody had on my list of questions is what level of supervision did I have by doctors? And the answer to that question is none. Um, while, while I was growing up in Hopedale, I did a bunch of work as a QA coordinator at a hospital um, in my, I guess it would be called the high school, uh, it'd be college years. And so I did quality assurance studies inside hospitals regarding infection control. And that was enough to cure me of going to doctors. Um, so I have to have something really bad with me to go to a doctor. But anyhow, I got up to, you know, 600, probably 600 pounds based on photos. And then uh, in, I'm going to say about 2006, 2007, I was commuting one way, about an hour and 45 minutes each way, and um, started having a lot of neuropathy in my feet and started having inflammation in my knees. And so I came home and told my wife, you know, it's time I... Um, it's time I lose the weight because I can't take my shoes off anymore after I get home from work. I had to have my kids do it. And that was, that was the thing that got me off the couch. Um, so I had my kids, um, told my kids I was going to lose weight. And at the time, the only diet I'd ever heard of that anybody had had any success with was the Atkins diet. And I didn't have time to do any research on it. Um, and also all I did was, Bought a bunch of Atkins shakes for my commutes and uh, drank shakes all day long. And um, then I would have one meal at night, which was low carb. And in my case, I made it low fat. Um, and um, I did that for two and a half years until I got below 500 pounds where I could weigh. And then when I got down to 450. I just got a real quick question. So when you're going through that, that those two years, what was your like... Like, uh, like, were you full or were you just constantly in that state of, you know, just felt like you always were robbed of nutrients? Like, like what was your, like, mental state with sticking with it? Because two years is a long time. Well, I mean, you, you got to keep in mind I'm very hard-headed. Um, and so I was in misery the whole time. I made everybody around me miserable. I was always hungry, but I, I did make it work. So unlike a lot of people that, that struggle with that low fat thing, I actually, you know, I, I've actually lost probably more weight doing the protein, the high protein, low fat than I have straight keto. Um, but it took me forever to do it. I mean, I was, it was slow and miserable. Um, so, so and it gets, the, it gets, it gets, yeah, going ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what was the point where you decided that that was so miserable that you wanted to change gears and switch your eating strategy? Well, it's, it's funny because it had nothing to do with, uh, I got down to 450 and I started feeling good. And so I started riding bicycle 
And when I was riding bicycle, everybody says, well, you have to load carbs. You can't do this low carb thing. And, and here again, having no, t- I mean, I was working 80, 90 hour weeks, having no time to do any research. I just believed them. And so I switched to calorie counting and high carb. And so I rode 17,000 miles in three years and gained 40 pounds counting calories and trying to maintain a thousand calorie deficit, uh, and, uh, a calculated, uh, uh, you know, uh, cal- a calorie, uh, count of 2,800 calories a day. So I was logging all my food on my fitness pal. I was doing the move more, eat less, you know, kind of nonsense that they preach. And what got me onto keto, oddly enough, was I was going to do a bike trip from Santa Barbara to Mexico with my son. And I was listening to a podcast with Jimmy Moore, and he had this uh, older couple from Omaha, Nebraska, on that rode bikes. And they talked about getting up, having a bulletproof coffee, and riding 150 miles. And at the time, because of my weight, I would literally get on the bike, and I'd have to eat four miles every four miles, or I would bonk. I would run out of I would run out of glucose. I mean, because I'm moving, you know, this huge frame down a bike path. And so I got sick of it. And so on that trip, I downloaded all these books and I started keto on uh, July, uh, January 1st, 2015. And uh, I think I've dropped about 130 pounds total um, doing keto, but keto is by far just not miserable. Um, So that's kind of because of time constraints, it's kind of a quick overview um, no, that's, right that's, now, that's my great, my weight is. I'm sorry, what? No, I said that's a great overview. Um, right now, my weight is at about 280. Uh, it varies between 280 and 290, and I'm not trying to lose weight for uh, something that happened this winter, which I'll get into next. Which was, um, I got bad pneumonia in December and got an atrial fibrillation in my heart. And so they, um, I had to give up bike riding for now. Um, and, you know, they tell you it's an incurable disease and so on. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's an irregular heartbeat and a high heart rate. So my heart rate, as we're speaking now, is probably about 140. Normally when I'm sitting at the desk, it's 120. And when I'm sleeping at night, it's about 90. And if I go, if I get up and walk, it hits 180 to 220, depending on what I'm carrying. Well, that's I, I can't even wrap my mind around that because I because I uh, you know, wear a heart rate sometimes when I work out, and I mean I am sprinting to get up up to that level. Well, that's the way I was when when I was keto, and we'll get into the talking about fasting. I the last long ride I did, I fasted for 60 hours, and then I rode 65 miles. And at the 70 hour mark, at the 70 hour mark, uh, you know, I felt great. And my heart rate, my average heart rate for that ride was like 145. You know, so I was in extremely good condition when this happened to me. Um, but that's a whole nother, uh, uh, discussion, uh, which I'm perfectly glad to do, but I know you guys have a bunch of questions here for me. Yeah. Um, so- when you're walking through that, though, um, when, when did you, you you talked about the different transitions and the in the trigger points for the different pieces? But what what triggered the the, the going to look into fasting? Fasting, it's funny. Uh, I had no idea what fasting uh, uh, was, other than I had a vegan friend in Colorado who I do programming for, and he had done a 21 day water fast. And uh, I was out there visiting him, and uh, I was about 10 months into keto. And um, he was really curious about keto because he's a vegan. And, um, and I was telling him about it, and, he said, and I said, you know, it's just really weird because unlike the other things that I've tried, I'm never hungry. I haven't been hungry literally since day one. And he goes, really? And I says, why don't you fast? And I said, I don't know. It just never, never occurred to me to try fasting. He said, well, I'll just give up food and see what happens. And so my first fast, I fasted 46 hours. And the only reason I ate was I didn't know anything about it and figured, well, I got to go on a bike ride. I was going to ride 22 miles in Oregon on the roads and I didn't want to have a hypoglycemic episode because I was going to be riding solo. So I went ahead and ate and came back, felt fine. And uh, so I started experimenting with fasting uh, long before I'd heard of Jason Fung or anybody else. 
Um, and so that was my introduction to it. Um, and so I probably tried every single fast known to man and then some, um, while I was healthy before December, last December. Uh, and I'm glad I did at the time. I didn't really fast with a purpose. I was just fasting for information. I kind of wanted to understand the data. Um, for people that know me, I collect a lot of data. And, uh, so I was collecting all this data and, uh, I'm glad I did it while I was healthy because that gave me baseline information for what I'm doing now. So, Tom, what was your, um, before you got sick in December, what was your longest fast that you did? Uh, I did a 21-day water fast. And that was in uh, October of last year. And uh, that was... uh, I could have kept going, and we had a meetup actually in October, and that's when I I bailed on the fast at a meetup. Uh, I host Let's keto meetups down friends. in St. Louis. <laughs> What's that? Blame it on your friends. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, the, the thing the, the thing that's weird is most people fast with a purpose, and my purpose is just gather information. And so during that 21 day water fast, I rode 341 miles on the bike. Um, and, you know, just learned some extraordinary amount of information, but I really didn't know what I would ever need it for. Um, so that was my longest. Uh, my, my Probably my most fun uh, fast that I've ever done was um, I hang out with a bunch of muscle heads on Facebook that uh, they fear the fat, and so they're into low-carb, high-protein, low-fat, which I've done. And uh, they kept saying, well, there's no way you can gain muscle mass on a fast. And uh, I said, well, that's not true. Um, and so what I did was I did a, I did a DEXA scan, and then I did an 11-day fast, and then I did a follow-up DEXA scan at the same time of day. And that was a straight water fast. And uh, I gained 1.4 kilograms of lean body mass, and I lost 5.8 kilograms of fat. And, of course, then their answer was, well, that was just water. Uh, of course, they're not understanding that, you know, when you start fasting at the 18 hour mark, you're getting all this human growth hormone kicking right. in and you're getting all these, um, wonderful benefits of fasting that they don't understand because they're afraid to go 12 hours without a protein shake. Yeah. So I think we both know people like that. Um, I work, I work yeah. at a gold gym, so I can definitely, <laughs> Oh yeah, you get it. <laughs> I get it. And, uh, they, none of them believe me. I work out fasted quite often and I, I get, always get strange looks. So can you talk a little bit more about those now that you've done the research? So you mentioned the growth home run. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the advantages to fasting now that you've uh, a lot more uh, knowledgeable about it? Well, yeah, at the 18 hour mark, uh, human growth hormone takes off for males and females. So for a female, the estimate is that you'll have 15% uh, sorry, 100, uh, 1,500% more human growth hormones circulating in your body at 18 hours than, say, at, uh, at zero. And the same way with, so even if you're doing intermittent fasting, you're getting a lot of human growth hormone. And, and that's probably what a lot of the people that do workouts do. Like if you're doing strength training, it's great to do intermittent fasting with it. For men, that's 2,000%. So we get a bump over the ladies. Um and then beyond that, of course, it starts generating uh, human growth hormone, has all these downstream effects. And that's what I'm doing now this year. Um, they tell you that atrial fibrillation is non-curable. Once you have it, like my type is I have cellular damage on the heart and on my lungs from the, from the pneumonia. And they tell you that's non-curable. Well, one of the benefits to fasting, of course, is autophagy and um and that peaks supposedly at three days. Um, you know, you're at seven, I think it's 70% of your peak rate, somewhere between 18 hours and three days. And so what I'm doing to treat myself, rather than going the route of using all these medicines and having procedures done, and my alternative is to go have an ablation every five to 10 years and have a bunch of meds for life. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm feasting, um, and then I'm doing fasting and I'm doing it in cycles because I want that autophagy to get rid of all my protein, my bad protein cells, reuse those amino acids and then generate new uh, cardio uh, mitochondria, which rebuild the heart. 
uh, contrary to what they used to tell us, the heart can regenerate. But for a normal glucose burner, that only happens in about 1% a year. And so what I'm trying to find out is if I can do it faster. And so literally I'll cycle uh, between 70 hours and 120 hours. I'll fast, straight water fast. And then I'll turn around and feast on a variety of proteins, usually a lot of things like liverwurst, Braunschweiger, bratwurst, any type of organ meat that I can, along with uh, I'll work in some nuts and nut butters. And then I try to put the weight back on um, because right now I want to maintain my current weight in case I end up having a medical emergency where I need to do a 120-day fast or something. So I, want, I don't want to lose my weight right now. So, so it's, it's kind of a it's kind of weird going from fasting without a purpose to fasting with a purpose. Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned that because that's the exact reason why I decided to try a fast. So before we we uh, had you lined up to speak, I did a five day fast solely for that purpose, the kind of cancer prevention kind of. Uh, oh yeah. I guess the what I don't know. It's I guess it's not solid pr- proving yet, but but the uh, right. hypothesis around that. So I, I really like that you are, are testing that because that's kind of kind of what I was doing. So for me, I tracked um, my keto my my keto. Yeah, I see that here. My, yeah. What, what what were you tracking? Because if you were a uh, techie nerd and you're tracking all this stuff, what were you tracking when you uh, are doing your cyclical, cyclical fast? Okay, it's it's changed some this year now that I'm fasting with a purpose. Last year, I was tracking what you were tracking. So I was tracking uh, my, glo- my goal. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, let me just add one more thing on fasting. One of the benefits is once the human growth hormone kicks in, the body starts generating all these stem cells. And so what I'm doing is essentially giving my heart stem cell therapy, with, but without paying for it. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of scientific study going on now for my condition and heart failure and those types of things where they're, they're injecting stem cells to try to get the heart to regenerate itself. And I'm just doing it for free. Um, now, is that what the, so last year when I was doing this, uh, you know, I read Tom Seafried's work and some of these other people. And so I was, my goal is to get my GKI, GKI below one as quickly as possible, which is what I'm seeing you're charting here. And, uh, my record was, uh, I think 36 hours. Um, and I did that just by doing straight water fast and then just go do as much cardio as quickly as possible. And I got my uh, blood ketones above four and my G, uh, my blood glucose below uh, 80. And uh, at that point, you're below one. And uh, you're in ther- therapeutic ketosis from that point on. And uh, you don't lose it like you, like you did there. Like your day five, there were 57. My lowest blood glucose was 49 and I didn't even feel it. Yeah, you, know, you don't even notice it. You just feel fine. Yeah, that that was definitely a weird thing for me. So, so just for people who have not are not really following what you just said there, can you talk a little bit about those uh, ranges um, and maybe like what somebody who is a sugar burner would feel like at that low blood of blood sugar? Well, yes, yeah, exactly. So what happens is uh, Tom Siegfried, uh, doctor, he's a he's a research scientist. He does clinical work too out of Harvard Medical School, he came up with this theory that you want to get your, um, it's, a, it's called a glucose ketone index, but you want to get it below two, and some people say one, to get the therapeutic benefits of ketones with all these metabolic diseases. And so people like with epilepsy and Alzheimer's, and they're trying to treat themselves, they want to keep their blood glucose level usually below 80 and their um, blood ketone level above four. And so when I first started, when I first started fasting, if I got below 90, since I wasn't highly adapted at the time, I would feel kind of funny. I'd feel almost kind of dizzy. And they, you know, they call that, uh, because I was probably type two, that's, that's kind of like a hypoglycemic feeling. You feel kind of out of control and dizzy. Um, and as you adapt over time, you can hang it higher, you can handle a much lower blood glucose level. And there have been people that have been down in the 30s. Um, 
So when I did my 65 uh, mile bike ride at, uh, after my 60 hour fast, while, while fasted, I rode the whole ride while I was fasted. I was riding with a type two diabetic nurse and her son has type one. And the only reason I took a blood measurement at 70 hours at dinner was, uh, I was sitting there not eating. She goes, what are you going to eat? And I said, I haven't eaten in 70 hours. And she looked at me and said, well, you should be dead on the floor. And I said, no, I feel fine. She goes, uh, you have your meter with you? And I said, sure, I can take measurements. And so I, my blood ketones were 6.8 and my uh, blood glucose was 49. And she says, you should be in a coma. And that's what a normal sugar burner would be. They would literally be in a coma at that level. But it, when you're fat adapted like that, you've got all these alternative fuel paths uh, to the brain. And, you know, so your brain is just sucking up all the ketones. Your body is still generating blood glucose as it needs it in the form of uh, the, for the brain. And um, so you're just highly efficient and you don't even feel it. It's, it's really kind of, it's almost euphoric. You feel like you're on a high, uh, which I've never been on a high, but that's what I'm told it's like. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, personally, I, I I didn't really feel any different. So it was weird because I, I would have thought um, that I would have noticed that more, but I don't know if it's because... Did I'm you stop at five days? I did. That's probably why. Uh, okay. But with those numbers, yeah, with those numbers, were you lifting during that? Yeah, I lifted on uh, the first day of my fast and the third day. I did not... Okay. Do- Day. I had planned to do the fifth day, but I, I bailed uh, because of scheduling problems, not because I didn't feel like doing it. Well, day three and day four are the worst. Uh, and once you're beyond that, it's just all mental. Yeah, day three was um, tough for me. I'm not going to lie. Actually, day two, dinner, uh, helping feed my kids. I have two small children. and hel- Helping them with dinner was really hard for me day two. Yeah, and see, that's the most important thing uh, for fasting is what you do before a fast. So you want to prepare mentally. And the other thing you want to do is you want to start it at a time where you're sleeping during the worst of it. And, and the more you fast, the more you get used to that. And I prefer to start my fast after lunch because that, for me, my bad time is uh, that second night. And usually I'm just sleeping through it then. I don't even notice it. And then oh, wow. uh, that really that holds true even after my AFib. It's still kind of the same. So maybe I should start after lunch on a Saturday and then just plan to sleep the whole weekend. <laughs> well, see, I actually start them like I'm going to start one probably tomorrow. Uh, I do have a meetup in St. Louis on Friday, and I'm thinking of fasting through it. Um, and then I'm I'm going to probably try to fast for 10 days this time. It's a little more difficult for me to fast now. Uh, because I have to be cognizant. I, I also track heart rate variability now uh, because I want to get a true reading of stress. And um, I have to really watch it because I don't want to put ex- an, an overt amount of stress on the heart because that's what I'm trying to heal. But uh, I'm finding, you know, anything from 70 hours to 120 just doesn't cause any stress. And I'm just going to push the limits a little more this time and watch the watch the data and then bail. Um, okay. whenever we've, we've got to have a separate entire <laughs> thing on that because uh, I've got a heart murmur and I track my heart rate variability for a while and um, I, I'd love to that's a whole separate conversation it's, it's a fantastic tool that not too many people in the community uh, the keto community or fasting community if you're in any of the groups on Facebook I actually posted the question today just out of curiosity and I've, so far today, I've got one person that's responded that they've used it during a 13-day fast. Most people don't even know what it is. What, what you find, and, and the reason I did it, John, is when you, when you fast for those extended periods of time, your mind plays games because, you know, it's thinking, okay, I mean, I'm out here. I'm trying to conquer the world. I'm trying to find food and eat. You know, that's what it's thinking you're doing. And so it's purely mental. And with HRV, when you're watching those numbers, you can tell whether there's actual real stress or not. I, and so I'll, I'll watch the sympathetic reading and the parasympathetic reading. And if it's, if it's bad two days in a row, I'll bail just because I don't want to risk it with my heart. I and then I just went to fast another day. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. I can't believe I didn't think about tracking HRV while I was doing it. That's 
kind of well, crazy. Well, I had discounted, be honest, John, I had discounted it really until this week because I figured with atrial fibrillation, with the irregular heartbeat, that it would invalidate the data. But this week, I actually found a bunch of studies that say, no, actually, it's, uh, it's still accurate, which surprised me. The reason I discounted it, you know, I was in really good cardio condition when this happened to me. I mean, I could go ride 70, you know, 65, 70 miles, not eat. You know, it was, my heart rate was always nice and low. And uh, after my AFib, my HRV data was still good. I mean, my numbers, people would kill for my numbers. And my lab, blood lab work is great. Everything is great except for this condition. And uh, so I just figured, well, that, that data is bad. I kept tracking it, but I was like, well, it's just bad data. But from what I'm reading, the studies say it's, it's accurate and uh, you should be using it to guide treatment. So, yeah, I'm going to start paying attention to it more. Yeah, we've got a couple people in town that do uh, that do um, counseling, and they use the they actually use that as part of the kind of meditative state. So they're tracking HRV yeah. during meditation. So I, I tried to get somebody on to talk about that, but because it's medical, they weren't comfortable. So I, I, I am definitely interested in a separate conversation about that. So we'll have to schedule that in because I am I'm really excited to talk about that well i should have more data by the time we talk about it um because i haven't even gone back i usually have a fasting spreadsheet um you know where like when i had the like when i did the 21 day water fast and the 11 day with the dexas i was having full blood draws done that is paying for out of pocket 550 dollars a pop every two or three days and so I have all that complete blood work for those periods. Um, I have all my uh, electrolyte blood work. And so I was I was really throwing a lot of money at it for no reason at the time, what I thought was no reason at all, but karma or God or whoever you believe in, you know, came back to really help me because when I gave up on traditional treatment for the disease, uh, my numbers are getting better. I mean, when I talk to people in these AFib support groups, they can't believe that my heart rate, that I can get my heart rate below 110 at night without drugs. You know, and I'm down in the 90s. Um, you use any when I started, I was in 150. When I get to sleep, when I got it, when I got AFib originally, I was in the 150s while sleeping. And now I've got it down in the 90s. So, Yeah, it's a big improvement. Yeah, fasting, fasting definitely heals. Uh, <laughs> you may not do that. You, you know, you may be doing it for weight loss and other things, but uh, uh, fasting with a purpose, you, you can definitely get benefit from it. So did you look into any type of uh, exogenous ketones or salts or anything to kind of kick your fast, quote unquote, into high gear early? Uh, I did it. I did it twice. Um, I used two different brands at the beginning of last year. Um, I used a keto OS and Kegenix just to see if it would make any difference. And, um, it, to me, especially during fasting, uh, it makes no difference in blood ketone readings at all because you're so jacked up with ketones. It doesn't matter. And I, I use ketonics. So I'm measuring breath acetone as well as blood. Um, I have a really cheap source for blood strips. I get them for a buck out of Australia. And so I, wow, I take three or four reading, I take three or four readings a day, you know, and so I, it didn't, it literally, I'd take a reading two hours later after having a keto OS or one of them, I go up like 0.2 and it's just like, I'm not even waste my money. Now, the only other time I've used them, um, was when I first started fasting with the heart condition, I took them, but not for the ketones. I didn't need them for that, but I was taking them because they're salts and I wanted the extra electrolytes because at the time I was still waiting for my, um, it takes about um, a week and a half to get good intracellular uh, lab work done and, and get your results back. And so when I was fasting, I wanted to make sure my electrolytes were high and it's a good way to get just a good broad spectrum electrolyte in you. So I was taking ketogenics for that. Uh, but it wasn't affecting my BHB readings at all. I mean, once you're adapted, I don't think it makes much of a difference. 
Well, now, like, yeah, but- unlike a lot of people, I'm not against them. I think they had their purpose. Uh, my mother-in-law has Alzheimer's, and uh, what we've noticed the extreme difference in her mental acuity when she takes MCT, even though she's a sugar burner, um, when she takes MCT on a regular basis with uh, Kegenics, she's definitely more cognizant. Uh, she's more, she has better cognitive scores. Uh, so they definitely have a purpose, but for me, they're they're useless. No, that's 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 interesting. Yeah, the keto the keto OS doesn't have a lot of. It's mostly powdered MTC in there. But yeah. Just and I've used the new form of Kegenix and the old form. Uh, so, but it doesn't touch my BHB readings. Um, I can. I've literally gotten to the point, like especially with my heart rate now. Um, my my BHB readings are typically lower because I'm so adapted. They're just getting used efficiently. And so at 24 hours, I can almost uh, 95% of the time, I'll be at 0. 0.6. At 48 hours, I'll be at 0. 0.9. And at the end of day three, I'll be at 1.4. And then after that, I'm always above three. Um, and then if I'm doing any type of cardio at all, I'll be above four or five. And it's just like clockwork now. Um, you can predict it. But the Kegenix doesn't even affect it. But a great sort of salt. They have a lot of uh, electrolyte in that product. All right. So would you mind, like, talking more towards it? Newbie, we kind of went so far into the details. And if yeah, you- sorry about that. No, that's a gr- that's a, I was it's, it's my fault. I was asking questions because I was excited with the direction we're heading. But if we step back a little bit, and you have somebody who's brand new, and you're going to give them some first time advice, and they're you know they're going to have concerns. What what would you tell them to kind of help them kind of uh, I guess ease into it per se? Well, I, it's funny because if you're friends with me on Facebook at New Year's every year. I put a photo out there, and, and it's it's meant to be funny, but it's also meant to lay concerns. And I, I, I always put the same one out, and it says, it's my fasting plan for the year. And then I have number one, eat. Number two, stop eating. Number three, eat. Number four, stop eating. Number five, eat. And it's just, and everybody laughs at it every time. But that's literally, we've all been fasting. And so what we're doing by doing the type of fasting that we're doing is we're just paying attention to it now and trying to fine tune it for a purpose. And so once you get beyond this fear that you're going to die because you haven't had food in three hours, uh, then you just start lengthening it out and saying, okay, when do I get hungry? And is that true hunger? Well, if it's not true hunger, maybe I can go a little longer. And so I literally, I have a group on Facebook where I do nothing but lead fast now. People will say, hey, I want to do a seven-hour fast. Fine, I'll add you to the group. And we discuss it, and I walk them through it. Because it's once you've been, it's amazing how quickly you progress and feel good during a fast. Because it, it's, it's just the unknown. It's just because it's unknown. Um, uh, but my, my thing is electrolytes. Watch your electrolytes. And um, the other thing is throw away the scale because you're not going to believe it anyway. Yeah, I've, I've gained I've gained two pounds one day on a fast, and you're just sitting there. Well, well what did I do? Well, you know, you probably gained muscle or you gained water. Who knows? But why play the mind game? So hide that sucker. If you haven't already gotten rid of it, hide it. Um, pay attention to how you feel. And the other thing is, live to fast another day. I, there's no reason to take any risk. I'm very risk adverse. Uh, doesn't sound like it doing a 21 day fast, but if you ever feel off, just quit fasting. I mean, it's easy to go grab a couple of bites of something that's easy to digest. I like avocado. You know, drizzle a little, drizzle a little olive oil on it, and just eat that at first because that gets the stomach fired up again. Just eat a little bit of it. And you'd think after a 21-day fast, you'd be ready to go eat about a 48-ounce steak, but you'll be full after six ounces because you're just not used to eating. So, Tom, the other you- thing that the other thing that I'll say about extended fasting beyond five days is you, you're going to have an emotional withdrawal, and it's kind of like losing a friend. 
because, and, and people don't believe me until they do it, but you, you get going and you, you start thinking of this fasting as your buddy. It's your support mechanism. And uh, you feel so euphoric and you feel great. And, and then when you finally say, okay, I got to let it go, it's literally like losing a relative. I mean, you just go through like two or three hours of emotional withdrawal and you're eating again. And it's like, okay, how soon can I do this again? It's really kind of addictive. So for somebody like me, Tom, and I know that you and I have had this conversation before, but I know logically that it's a good thing. I know that it's healthy. Um, I even do intermittent fasting, but uh-huh. I cannot wrap I, – I, I, at about the 16 or 17-hour mark, I start looking at my watch, and I think the longest that I've made it was about 18 hours, and there's something that mentally I just cannot get past that, and I, I have to eat. And I mean, I know that I don't, but – what would you, what would you you know what kind of advice could you give for somebody like me who just cannot mentally let eat, that go? Just eat breakfast and then start, and then you'll be asleep during the eighteen hour point, and then you'll wake up the next morning and feel wonderful and say, "Oh wow, that wasn't that bad." It's it's literally all the mind game. It it, it sounds weird. Now you do want to make sure you have your electrolytes because if you're off, you will feel hungry. And when you, you know, say so, that, do you recommend like something like bone broth or do you do like salt well, see, water? The only, the only reason I would shy away from bone broth is if you need autophagy because there's protein. So if you want autophagy, and there's not a lot of protein in bone broth, but if, if you're really focused on autophagy like me, I won't touch it during a fast. I want to avoid all protein. So what I do if I want to keep my stomach going, which I do on my fast now, I will take a spoonful or two of sauerkraut or kimchi, which is nothing but fermented carb, and I'll bury it in salt. And I'll eat that once or twice a day. You know, it's probably, if if anything, it might be five or 10 calories. I've also done it with dill pickles. And that's because I don't like drinking salt water. I don't like the taste. Um, but I'll add it, I'll just literally bury it in salt and I'll eat that. And that that, fermenta- that fermented product keeps the stomach going. And so when you come out of the fast at the other end, it's not as hard. Now, a lot of, you know, the fasting police will stand up and say, well, you ate something, so that's not a fast. And But I've done the straight water fast, and I've done it with, uh, with uh, you know, the 5 to 10 calories of uh, kraut or whatever it is. And there's no difference in my BHB readings. There's no difference in my blood glucose readings. And I feel fabulous. And so I don't really care what they say. Um, I know I'm still getting the benefits. So I go back and forth. But it, it, to me, your, your goal is to get over the hump. If, if you're a skinny person, what I'd recommend is taking like a piece of butter or even do a BPC or something because your body can only release so much fat a day. And if you're fat adapted, you will feel miserable at three or four days or five days. There's actually calculators online on the two keto dude sites that'll tell you how much fat you, you can actually release in a day. And so if you're having, you know, if you're a weightlifter or something and you're, you've got a high caloric output, if, I don't count calories, but if you have a high caloric output, you're going to feel miserable if you can't release enough fat. You know, even a highly adapted person, you're limited and to the amount you can release in a day. So yeah. that's crazy. Cause like I seriously to prep for this, I listened to that two keto dudes podcast on fasting and just heard about that last night. So that's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. Richard Morris has a calculator out. Well, I'm part of their admin team, but he's got a calculator out there. Um, that will let you calculate that. And that's based on the, the starvation studies. And so, you know, even somebody starving, uh, they can only release so much fat a day. That's why, like, these people, these prisoners of war are miserable when they're in these camps, literally starving to death, because they don't, they don't have enough fat. They can't release enough fat. You know, the body's going to protect its fat stores, too. So it's going to, what it's going to do is shut down energy output. And so there's nothing wrong, especially for diabetics, to take just butter or something that's low glycemic that's not going to bump up your insulin much just to continue the fast to continue getting the benefit. Because you're, if for a diabetic, their goal is to keep that insulin low. You know, they, want that, they don't want that insulin roller coaster. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, you, you do what it takes. It depends on your goals. Like mine with the autophagy, I won't touch protein during a fast. And I, I did burn buff. I've even done protein spur, uh, spurring modified fast last year, but I won't do one now because for my goal, which is heart reconstruction, it's counter, it's counterproductive. I mean, I have in my body 14 days of stored amino acids. If I don't take any protein for 14 days, I will not lose lean body mass. I know that. I've documented it. And, you know, you've got weightlifters that, oh, if I go 18 hours without protein, I'll die. And it's like, no. <laughs> so it's all goal dependent. But for your specific question, Jolene, I would start after breakfast. I would eat a big breakfast and then I would sleep through the 18 hour mark and the next morning you'll just be amazed it's like well maybe i can make it till noon and just keep increasing the distance okay. but there is there are people that can't do it you know there there's mechanisms that you know if the fat doesn't release consistently or something and it's just miserable don't do it just do intermittent you're getting most of the benefit out of just being ketogenic anyway i mean it's it's a fat mimicking diet fasting mimicking diet you know you're getting the benefit low of the the low insulin roller coaster anyway. Well, I know we're uh, we're out of time. We already went over, but do you have time for one more question? There was one more question submitted beforehand. That's oh yeah, I've got nothing going on. Let's talk shit. Is that the one? That's the one. <laughs> but I yeah. was like, I'd hate to end on that, but uh, and I, I worded it, the I, I worded the question to say Bristol stool chart. But I yeah, think you were nice and polite. Um, that's right. <laughs> I worked on hard. I I worked on hog farms and cow farms. I know where it all goes. I mean, <laughs> it's. But when you stop, I mean, I think that's a question that a lot of you know, like newer people, um, you know, wonder because obviously if you stop eating, then you know it. it uh, there's got to be some point where you're not you're not digesting anymore. So. Do you mind talking since you're a pig farmer? Or a pig farmer? You don't mind getting into the, the gritty details? I, I wasn't born on a farm, but I worked a bunch of them. So, you know, I'm very aware of what happens on pig farms and cow farms, dairy and so on. Uh, you know, and Hopedale, there's nothing but farmers. So that's what you did in the summer. You work farm work. Uh, so what's going to happen at two or three days, uh, for me, it's usually about 36 hours you're going to find out that you are really full of shit. And most people <laughs> don't realize, I mean, because they just think management is. Sorry, hopefully no managers in the room. Um, but you're going to find out that you've got stuff in you that you didn't know you had. And um, it's usually, for most people, it's not an explosive thing. So you're going to be right in the middle of the Bristol chart. Uh, you're going to feel wonderful afterwards. And that's going to be from about 36 hours to about 60 hours for me. And then it's going to go away. And then you're going to see stuff about every three or four days that you just like, I didn't even know I had that in me. Uh, and it's, it's off the charts. I mean, it's, it's splatter, it's spray. When you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> and it's just off and on and it's nothing consistent. I mean, I, and, uh, I mean, you feel great when it's gone. Uh, a lot of times there's no volume to it. And, and then a lot of times you'll get us going and it's like, my goodness, uh, I needed to double bag that. Um, <laughs> and so it literally, it's, and it never ends. I mean, the 21 day water fast, I, every three or four days. I, and so I'm just assuming that that's the autophagy, you know, the results of autophagy because, uh, you're just seeing some really bizarre stuff, but it's not really bizarre till to me at least after five or six days, and then it just goes really weird. <laughs> okay, well you've got to end somewhere else other than that because if anyone had been considering it at this point, they're not. Because I, I I have to say, I mean, I only did five days, but I I never had any episode like that. No, it's it's after that. Yeah, you really uh, it's it's. It's weird, and Jimmy Moore talks about it in his book, which I, actually I didn't get to read until after my seventeen, uh, my twenty-one day fast. I told him I was going to fast until the book came out, but it took them too long to write it, um, <laughs> so I stopped. Um, 
but he uh, he talks about that in the book. Um, but it's not it's nothing scary or anything. It's just bizarre. I mean, you think, okay, okay, so there are aliens that live inside us. <laughs> um. All right. Well, we are about to lose our room, so I know we ran over a okay. little bit, but. Is it is it possible that you could give me some uh, contact information if somebody's considering this and they want to join that Facebook group? Is that is that a public thing or is it a keto group or if you? Uh, oh, the fasting some... Facebook group. Yep, that, that's just the one I host, and I don't even know the name of it. Uh, I can get all that to Jolene. I can copy and paste it to her. Yeah, I don't mind if people contact me. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll I, I call I call it kind of guided fasting um, because there's a lot of people that get to two or three days, and uh, so the last group I did I did with uh, two people one went seven and one went ten and I went with them, uh, and it's just nice they feel like they can you know they can an- they can ask questions quickly and get a response and I don't charge for it or anything I just it's easier to track through a group. Um, and my only advice to everybody is just avoid the fasting, please. Uh, you know, if you look at the dictionary definition of a fast, you'll be amazed that it's not what they tell you it is. You know, so you'll have people that do straight water fast, and they'll say, oh, man, you're just terrible because you ate something. And then you'll have people that do nothing but protein sparing modified fast, and they'll say, oh, yeah, you had carb, that's terrible. And then you have the dry fasters, and they said, you drank water, and that's terrible. Ignore them all. Just make the fast your own and uh, make it something you're comfortable with because, you get, you know, it's, you just want to live to do it and uh, you'll get all the benefit from it and uh, yeah, lose anxiety over it, you know. Perfect. So I'll get Jolene all the contact information and, uh, yeah, if you ever want me back, I'm happy to come back. I I live a boring life. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you can get me that information, we can put it in the show notes. And Tom, as always, it was great talking to you. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. You're full of information, so thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, uh, next time I'll take pictures for the Bristol stool chart. Um, <laughs> I'll use that camera phone, and uh, that way I can provide, uh, I, I can provide photo evidence that uh, UFOs do exist. Okay, well, okay, so uh, I guess we don't need you back after all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's better than video. <laughs> oh. All right. All right, well, thank you so much again, Tom. Uh, next week we will have our uh, normal Q&A session, so uh, we'll get those invitations out to everyone. And um, remember, you can contact us on our website, ketoniancorner.com. We're also available on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and uh, Twitter. So thank you guys, and we'll talk. Thanks for listening. For more details, head over to www.smallprimalhabits.com.